Good morning. Good morning. <clears throat> this month we're talking about this God whom we serve, and we're looking at passages, especially from the Old Testament, that talk about the nature of God, the characteristics that describe him and define him. And as we look at these passages, we're gaining insights into why we serve God, why we believe in him and why we believe in Jesus. A couple of weeks ago, we looked at one of the great texts in the Bible, Exodus chapter 34, verses 8 and 9. Uh, pardon me, verse 6 7, that talk about how God is a God of steadfast love. And last week we looked at Psalm 68, that stressed that our God is a God who protects the vulnerable. He is a father of the fatherless, a protector of widows and widowers, and the empower of women and men who announce his will to others. Today we're looking at Je Jeremiah chapters 8 and 9, which give us insight into another side of God's character and who he is. We think of God as a God of justice. We think of God as a God of power, a great creative force, a God of love even, a God who protects but those of us who are parents, as we think about the nature of God, are we really surprised that, that God, our Father, is a God who suffers? Because we suffer on behalf of our children, do we not? We have dreams for them. We have, asked, we have hopes. And we want our children to know love, to know joy, to know happiness, to have things go their way. And when they do not, When someone insults our child, it feels a little bit like they insulted us, doesn't it? If our child comes home bleeding, I always feel a little bit of pain myself. So as we think about God and his nature, we have to align our picture of the all-powerful, all-knowing God with the picture of God who is described here in Jeremiah chapters 8 and 9 as the God who says, Oh, that my head were waters and my eyes were a fountain of tears. A God who weeps. And we have to ask, what causes God to suffer? And when God suffers, what are the implications? <laughs> what else, who else suffers when God suffers? And how can we reduce God's suffering? I don't think that Advil or Aleve or our answers here. There is no medication to reduce God's suffering. Jeremiah chapter 8 begins in a time in Israel's history when the leadership of God's people had rebelled against him. As Jeremiah preached, another passage in Jeremiah describes how when his writings were taken to the king, 
the king, as the words were read to him, would take the peach pages they were read and would take his knife and slice them and throw them into the fire. And Jeremiah himself would later be thrown into a pit. And God says to Jeremiah that the faith that awaits those who rebel will will be horrible. Death shall be preferred to life, he says in verse 3, by all the remnant that remains of this evil family in all the places where I have driven them, declares the Lord of hosts. And you shall say to them, thus says the Lord, when men fall, do they not rise again? If one turns away, does he not return? He starts to go away, doesn't he come back? And why then? The Lord asks, has this people turned away in perpetual black backsliding? They hold fast to deceit. They refuse to return. I have paid attention and listened, but they have not spoken rightly. No man relents of his evil, saying, what have I done? Everyone turns to his own course, like a horse plunging headlong into evil, into battle. Even the stork in the heavens knows her times, and the turtle dove, swallow, and crane keep the time of their coming. But my people know not the rules of the Lord. As God describes his plight and, and his reaction to what's going on in his people's lives, He tells us some things about himself. Things that we can even take comfort in. God listens. And I think that's a great thing to remember when we're praying. That God is hearing our prayer. And he says, I paid attention. What we do, what we say, what we think matters. He pays attention. In any relationship, aren't those valuable assets? To know that the one to whom you're speaking actually is hearing what you're saying? Is paying attention? And he, one of the things too that surfaces in chapters 8 and 9 is, that as God is suffering over the plight of his creation, it's not just the people of Israel he's worried about. It's not just human beings that he's worried about. He addresses the situation of animals and birds and even the, the earth itself. And how they all impact one another as part of his, his creation. And his point in verse 7 is that even in their instincts, the birds of the air know when to fly south. They know when to come back north. They know God's design for them. But these people, he says, do not know the rules of the Lord. Do not know God's plan for them. When I would gather them, down in verse 13, he continues, There are no grapes on the vine, nor figs on the fig tree. Even the leaves are withered. And what I gave them has passed away from them. Earlier he has said that in their abominations they were not at all ashamed. They didn't even know how to blush. Sometimes we talk about conscience in that way. That you know a person's lost their conscience when, when they forget how to blush. 
in verse 18, the passage that was read to us earlier. Verses 18 through through 22, and it's really as you read through commentaries, you'll see a difference of opinion about whether God's expressing His grief in these verses as he obviously is in the first verses of chapter 9, or whether it's the prophet Jeremiah as the faithful servant of the Lord, who is agreeing and aligning his desire and his agony with, 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 with God. And saying, my joy is gone, grief is upon me, my heart is sick within me. Behold the cry of the daughter of my people from the length and breadth of the land. Is the Lord not in Zion? Is her king not in her? The people were crying. And then you have, as if, if it were an answer from the Lord, why have they provoked me to anger with their carved images and with their foreign idols? And then an answer from the people. The harvest is past, the summer is ended, and we are not saved. Where, where is God? And he, and he answers. Back. Is there no balm in Gilead? Is there no physician there? Why then has the health of the daughter of my people not been restored? The area of Gilead north Northeast Israel was known for its medicines, its bombs, its salves that had healing properties. He said, is there no balm in Gilead? If you look at number 734 in our psalm book, there we have that song that we sing sometimes. There is a balm in Gilead. It comes from this passage. That there is a balm in Gilead that heals the sin-sick soul. But then at the beginning of chapter, chapter 9, God begins to express his pain. Oh, that my head were waters and my eyes a fountain of tears, that I might weep day and night for the slain of the daughter of my people. Oh, that I had in the desert a traveler's lodging place, that I might leave my people and go away from them, for they all are adulterers. A company of treacherous men. They bend their tongue like a bowl. Falsehood and not truth has grown among them in the land, for they proceed from evil to evil, and they do not know me, declares the Lord. Sometimes there are places that uh, will host, churches even, that will host what they call Mother's Day Out. Maybe you've seen those or taken advantage of those or wish that you could. You needed a break as a parent. Do you ever think about this passage here? God wanted to take a vacation from you. From dealing with us. I need, I need some time here. The Lord says, the suffering is so intense. For they proceed from evil to evil, and they do not know me, declares the Lord. It says in verse 10, I will take up weeping, and wailing, and this is what I was talking about earlier, about how God's concern in this passage extends beyond his, ex his love for Israel, extends beyond his love for all of humanity. To even where he weeps and he wails for the mountains and the pastures of the wilderness. Because they are laid waste so that no one passes through and the lowing of cattle is not heard, both the birds of the air and the beasts have fled and are gone. And why? Why are they gone? He's, I will make Jerusalem a heap of ruins, a lair of jackals, 
And I will make the cities of Judah desolation without inhabitant. Now 12 is the question I just asked. Who is the man so wise that he can understand this? To whom is the mouth of the Lord spoken that he may declare it? Why is the land ruined and laid waste like a wilderness so that no one passes through? And the Lord says that the reason that the landscape is barren, that the crops are not yielding, that, that the birds have disappeared, because they have forsaken my law that I sat before, that sat before them, and have not obeyed my voice or walked in accord with it. But have suddenly followed their own hearts and have gone after the bells that their fathers taught them. Thus says the Lord, is the response. That begins down in verse 23. Our, our sin, our disobedience to God, stems often from our own desires, our own lust, our curiosities. But also what stems from a misunderstanding of, of how we are, are designed and, and how, we, how we work, if you will, most efficiently for what God has intended us as his creation what God intends for you and for me to be. If I use my bicycle to mow my yard, it's not going to work really well. If Tommy uses a fly swatter to change somebody's oil, it'll be, a, it'll be at best a mess. And when we live our lives in ways that are contrary to God's will for our lives, it's pretty much the same way as me trying to mow my yard with my bicycle or Tommy using that fly swar to change oil. So what are we going to do? Thus says the Lord, beginning with verse 23 of chapter 9, let not the wise man boast in his wisdom. And if, you, if you've studied 1 Corinthians, these words may sound a little familiar from chapter 1 of 1 Corinthians. Let not the wise man boast in his wisdom. Let not the mighty man boast in his might. Let not the rich man boast in his riches. Got three categories there, don't you? But let him who boasts boast in this, that he understands and knows me, that I am the Lord, that practices steadfast love, justice, and righteousness in the earth. For in these things I delight. He says, I am the Lord who practices steadfast love, justice, and righteousness in the earth. And remember what Exodus 34, verses 6 and 7 said. The Lord defines himself, the Lord, the Lord, a God merciful and gracious, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love and faithfulness, keeping steadfast love for thousands, forgiving iniquity and transgression and sin, but who will by no means clear the guilty, visiting the iniquity of the fathers on the children and the children's children to the third and the fourth generation. God is a God of steadfast love, but he's also a God of justice. And as we've seen this morning, he is a God who suffers when his people do not do not go as in the right way. Justice surfaces in verse 25 and following. Behold, the days are coming, declares the Lord, when I will punish those who are circumcised merely in the flesh. Egypt, Judah, Edom, the sons of Ammon, Moab, and all who dwell in the desert, who cut the corners of their hair, for all these nations are uncircumcised, and all the house of Israel is uncircumcised in heart. We look in Colossians, in the New Testament, Colossians chapter 2. God says in Jeremiah chapter 9 that 
Israel's problem is they may be circumcised physically, but they're not circumcised in their heart, in their thinking. So Paul writes, Therefore, as you receive Christ Jesus the Lord, so walk in him, rooted and built up in him and established in the faith, just as you were taught, abounding in thanksgiving. In him also you were circumcised, with a circumcision made without hands, by putting off the body of the flesh, by the circumcision of Christ, having been buried with him in baptism, in which you were also raised with him through faith, in the powerful working of God, who raised him from the dead. An analogy might be to say that if you dunk someone in a swimming pool, they've not been baptized necessarily. They probably just got wet. But if the, you dunk them full of the water, before you dunked them all the water, they had resolved that they were going to turn away from sin, that they were going to cut it out of their lives, that they were going to follow God's will and, the, and Jesus' in, commands with intensity and with intention, yes, you were baptizing them when you plunged them beneath, beneath the water. Just that, and when they came back up, they were raised into a new life. Receiving the Spirit of the Lord, just as Christ was raised from the dead. So what we gain from this description of God's suffering, which is so intense that he, he talks of mourning, of weeping, of almost wanting a vacation from his people, is that God listens and he pays attention to us. That he weeps and he suffers when we hurt ourselves. And when in hurting ourselves, we also hurt not only ourselves, but the rest of his creation through the impact of our actions. And that God, he notes later back in chapter 8, God wants to harvest good fruit from his people. Some of us have been studying the book of Galatians on Monday night. And this next week we'll get more into the kind of fruit that God wants to harvest. Love, joy, peace. Things like that. God wants to harvest good fruit from his people. Yes. When we do not live as we are designed to live. Our Creator suffers. So our question is, will we cut sin from our lives? Will we, as is put in Jeremiah 9 and Colossians 2, circumcise our hearts? Will you and will I follow the Lord with all our heart, with all our mind, with all our soul? If you need to obey the Lord today, if you need to reconcile yourself to the Savior from whom you have turned away by asking the rest of his people to pray for you, or if you need to identify yourself with the Lord by being baptized into the name of his Son today for the forgiveness of your sins, please, let's not make God suffer anymore. Let's bring joy to our Creator. Let us all stand together and sing.